Hi, everyone. I'm Shertia Brantley, Deputy New York Bureau Chief and Senior Editor for Bloomberg Live. And I'm delighted to discuss the 110 Initiative with its board co-chairs, Jenny Rometty, former Executive Chairman and CEO of IBM, and Ken Frazier, Chairman and CEO of Merck. Welcome, Jenny and Ken. Thank, Thank you, Shertia, for having us. Pleasure to meet and speak with you both. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I'll get started with you, Ken. What is the elevator pitch for 110, and how did this initiative come about? So 110's mission is to combine the power of American companies to hire, train, and advance one million Black Americans over 10 years into family-sustaining jobs with opportunities for advancement. And what prompted the creation of this initiative? Well, let me start by saying that all, many companies have been working on these issues for years and years, um, but we've been working on them by ourselves. And I think following the tragic events around the George Floyd murder, I think it spurred discussions all over the country at kitchen tables and boardroom tables. And some of the leading CEOs came together and asked, what is it that we as business can do to create more opportunity? You know, Americans all aspire to be a land of opportunity and economic opportunity is among the most important forms of opportunity. And you know what corporate America does is it provides a significant amount of economic opportunity. So we started asking ourselves, what is it that we can do as this generation of CEOs to create that real opportunity for Black Americans? And as you may know, uh, more than 75% of working age Black Americans lack a four-year degree. And so we said, you know, if we can focus on skills-based hiring rather than credentials-based hiring, we can maybe start to address the intergenerational economic gaps and opportunity gaps that exist for African-Americans. Jenny, how are you leveraging your experience with IBM's P-TECH program to support 110's mission? Well, this is what I'd almost call a movement that I started in with IBM. It was almost a decade ago now. And it was because as we would look to hire people, they weren't available. And even then, unemployment was 10% and they didn't have the digital skills. So we took a step back and said, look, there's a whole group of people, a swath of America that is talented, but that it's not in our hiring pool. And we said, we can't wait. You know, Ken said, uh, black Americans, less than 80% have a uh, college degree. For Americans in general, the number is 60%. And we said for many jobs, we actually could start them without a college degree and have this concept, you use the repeat tech, it's pathway to technology, early college, high school. Could we go to high schools and they were in the most underserved communities, work with a community college, and could we prepare them enough that we could bring them in and start them in a role without a four-year degree? They'd come with an associate's degree. Well. Now forward nine years you know, after that has started, we've got 270 schools in 24 countries. It is about 150,000 kids coming through and they have made outstanding employees. And we've really dispelled a lot of myths that it isn't that they're not talented, they don't have access. So to Ken's point, if you really believe like we do now, that it isn't just a digital divide you're solving, but there's also this point that economic opportunity is really the great equalizer for all of racial injustice. This is a perfect program to help feed into this. So uh, P-TECH will provide one source of talent, but IBM is also a company like the other 38 companies now who will commit to hiring. And I should say that 90% of our students in this P-TECH program are black and Latinx. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about over-credentialing. Um, how does 110 help us overcome this barrier that we find when it comes to um, you know, job descriptions, typically mandating a four-year college degree, Ken? So the whole point of 110 is to take a different approach to job creation by challenging sort of the status quo and advocating for just that skills-based hiring approach. It's about doing the difficult work of thinking differently about talent, as Jimmy said, and knowing that we have talent in, in untraditional places. And so shifting to skills first, we think is an imperative to achieving greater equity and inclusion, because as long as we have explicit four-year college degree requirements, we are creating systemic barriers to many black and other underrepresented Americans 
who too often, frankly, don't have the financial means to pursue one. So our starting goal is really around making sure that we look at our own job requirements and make sure that we are looking at whether or not those job requirements truly do require a four-year degree or whether we're actually looking for a set of skills that people without a four-year degree can develop. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, can you weigh in on new collar jobs and how they fit within this initiative? Yes, well, new collar was a phrase that we had coined, and it was for a very good reason. As we went to bring in people into the workforce that didn't have a four-year degree into a company like Merck, like IBM, that had always hired four-year degrees or PhDs, it was a way to say, look, this is not a group that is not talented. So you might have heard of the phrase of blue collar or white collar. New collar was meant it's just a different and new segment because we really need to normalize that you are not um, taking down the level of employee in your company. That's not what this is about. These are really talented people, that, as I said, didn't have access. And so the idea would be to tell everyone and spotlight them. I know I spent years highlighting them every opportunity I could to say, look at how talented these people are and a couple statistics that are really interesting. So we went about the work, as Ken said, to remove the degree requirements. So now, 47% of our jobs don't require a college degree. Over the last three years, 15% of our hiring has been what we coined new collar, but meaning the kids that, or people, it's not all kids that did not have four-year degrees. And a really interesting statistic is that, you know, once they're around others and they see the mobility and the opportunity, 74% have actually gone back to get their four-year degrees. And we've had our first PhD. And then one of the people through this program is also now going to medical school. So this is really, again, I keep using the word about access and providing opportunity. There are so many talented Americans. So this is good for business that are out there. So many parts of the population we're not tapping into. And this allows us to, I think, solve perhaps the most important problem in this country, which is to give people economic opportunity. And it is the greatest source in my mind of, um, of both peace in this country, of unity in this country, of, of and frankly, great for our businesses who need this talent. And when we look at the job functions, Ken, that are ideal uh, for this initiative, it's jobs within what technology, medical devices, business and finance operations. What are some of the other opportunities uh, that are well suited for this? Well, I'll pick one, and that's manufacturing. Across this country, there are a lot of people who are, you know, small to mid-sized manufacturers who have these kinds of excellent jobs with career advancement opportunities. But that's a skills-based type situation where they can't find the people who have the specific skills to do the kind of more complicated manufacturing processes that are typical of, of, of America today. So we want to work with people like the National Association of Manufacturers to try to hire hundreds of thousands of these people who need to get a certain set of skills before they can actually uh, be in the manufacturing field. Healthcare is another area. Uh, there's a huge amount of of these kinds of activities and work and, and work opportunities in healthcare. And healthcare, of course, is one of the growing uh, areas of our economy. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned leveraging trade groups like uh, NAM, for example. How do you plan on tapping uh, your connections within private equity or reaching out to small and mid-sized businesses to help scale this initiative, Jenny? Well, look, we, we're really clear, and as we've done our work, while well, we've got 40 of these, almost 40 greatest companies, and everyone is going to tap their supply chain, we know we won't hit the million and exceed it without small, medium business and anyone who has a network. So we've really invited and are inviting uh, that ability to bring all these companies in. But you know, a really important point, what the big companies can do, uh, obviously they're all investing both uh, the ability to hire and money. So we've got $100 million raised just for the first year. But one of the tricks here is matching supply and demand. And so the big ones have the opportunity to go and work with all the different talent providers and help them scale. Because if you step back and look at what another one of the problems has been, it's that as you go look for black employees, and even without four-year degrees, the places you look, they're, they're effective programs, but they're not at scale. So whether it's a community college or a non-for-profit, they may produce 20, 30 candidates, but we've got to get those to scale. So in, a, in essence, 110 is supply and demand. And so what we want to do, the 
but you can picture the bigger companies working on really helping scale the supply and then demand to be filled by everyone, not just the big, our supply chains, small, medium business, private equity companies, because what will make this work is my experience has been we are bringing the silver thread, which is the promise of a job. And once you have a promise of a job, you can get these talent providers to help scale because they aren't just producing talent and not sure it will be hired. So we've got a skills first paradigm, we match supply and demand, and then we really help scale. So while it is yes, the first round are large companies, um, we absolutely will be filling demand from many of the small companies that are out there. In fact, it's 50% small medium business in, the, in our country, right? So they will be filling a lot, but I would look to the larger ones to help work with the supply side to build the talent to then be filled by everyone else. And, and everyone understands that is that's their role. So that's what it will take to drive that kind of number. It will take all of us. Mm -hmm. And just, following up on that, Ken, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just gonna say, we welcome anybody who's watching uh, who wants to help us with this initiative. As, as Jenny said, small and medium businesses power the majority of our economy and you are quite welcome. Definitely. Um, I want to talk about fragmentation in the, the jobs process and how 110 can sort of uh, connect those dots. Ken, can you expand on that? Well, I think, first of all, I think one of the situations that we're addressing is the complete failure of the educational training system to connect people to the jobs that they need. There are a lot of people, for example, who go to community colleges, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those community colleges, which are all doing a good job, are training people to the specific skill sets that employers need. So as Judy said earlier, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have economies of scale on the demand side. On the supply side, as you just alluded to, there are a lot of organizations that are doing a good job uh, of training people, but they tend to be subscale and they tend to be fragmented. We believe by bringing this so-called economy of scale on the demand side, we can actually help some of those really terrific organizations scale up uh, to be able to train even more people than they are right now. So that's a big part of what we're trying to do is not just match employers with those talent providers as well as job seekers, but we want to support those fragmented talent developers, if I can call that, with the additional funding to actually come up to scale. Mm. Now, both of you have referred to 110 as a startup. And, you know, a startup is typically shaped by the vision of its CEO as well as its founders. Uh, today, you have announced that Maurice A. Jones um, will be the CEO of 110. Um, he's currently the CEO and president of the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. Uh, Ken, can you expand on why Maurice was the right person for this job? Well, let me just say, that first of all, we went through a very robust, careful selection process to try to identify the ideal candidate to lead this initiative. You mentioned it's a startup. Uh, it's really important that we do this in a way that produces results very quickly, but it also requires knowledge of the field. And we found somebody who actually meets both of those standards, ability to run a startup organization who understands the field. And so we're excited to announce Maurice Jones as our new CEO of of 110, and as you alluded, he has a long-standing career in this area. Uh, he's worked in the public sector, he's worked in the private sector, in addition to being the CEO of LISC, as you just mentioned, he's worked in the past as the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, among other things. He's not formally in the role, he'll be that way in March, but he actually knows this field. He knows the providers, he knows the challenges that we face. And I know from my conversations with him, he's very excited to join this committed group of companies that are bringing a commitment on the demand side, because that frankly has been what's been missing for many, many years. So, Jenny, does his hiring and his vast, you know, experience that Ken just mentioned, you know, Deputy Secretary at HUD during the Ob uh, Obama administration, does this hiring signal any potential future partnerships with either the federal, state, or local governments going forward with uh, 110? 
Well, look, it, this is a, an interesting word you use on partnerships. Uh, what it signals, it's reinforcement that we are trying to federate any and all that help this program and, and help the problem. Because Maurice, um, I should say, LISC is the, the country's largest non-for-profit community development. So he has experience at scale and he knows that this is a very local issue. So we're talking about populations, they're not mobile. So therefore you've got to work by city to do this. And that is a set of partnerships. And in fact, as Ken was speaking earlier, I mean, one of the reasons I was so excited about the formation of this is that everyone's got some good ideas. The government has some good ideas. Individual companies have some good ideas. Bank of America is doing a great thing. IBM was doing, Merck has it, but none of us can scale to the size of the issue. And so into the opportunity. So this program welcomes all of these, it federates them, doesn't try to replace it. So we take all different kinds of supply programs, if you wanna call it that, we bring them in and now we offer more people to hire from them or we have more people now willing to hire and therefore we scale the supply. So I think this is perfectly suited to what Maurice knows how to do, which is to locally pull partners together. And there is a big role for when you, whether you speak of the federal government, look, there are policies that would make a big difference for these populations that are underserved. Universal broadband is one. There is the Higher Education Act. The country spends $120 billion in student aid, but today you have to be a full-time college student. We are talking about people that they have families to support or they have got to go to school part-time. Changing programs like that to be, just have you be part-time and qualify for aid. Those are really important things that we are gonna continue to articulate and look for help for from the federal government. But Maurice is a perfect man to federate all of these pieces together. Mm -hmm. The labor market, as we know, has been decimated by the pandemic. Ken, what do you say to critics who may say, one million jobs over 10 years, that's too long and it's not bold enough? Well, first of all, we wanted to put a stake in the ground. We are by no means wanting to be limited by one million jobs, and we want to do it a lot faster than 10 years. But we wanted to put a stake in the ground, particularly for the 37, 38 now, companies that are founding members. We wanted to be very careful about identifying a clear and measurable commitment. By no means do we want to be restrained by just those early commitments. Uh, my, my belief is that with Maurice's leadership and other companies seeing the opportunity to do this, we'll do even more than a million people and we'll do it faster than in 10 years. And by the way, while we're starting with a focus on Black Americans, we hope to expand beyond Black Americans to other people who are underrepresented, who don't have the opportunities. We have found in the past that when you create opportunities for one group or you reduce barriers for one group, you help everyone. Definitely. You know, as this reckoning on race in America continues, um, there's more and more talk about uh, racial economic justice and the widening wage and wealth gaps we see in this country. Um, a typical Black family has $4,000 in net wealth compared to $147,000 for a typical white family. Jenny, how does this program help to sort of close that gap? Yes, well, I have to say the statistics you just cited, those are one of the major reasons that we have focused so closely on providing jobs because the way to change that is to provide economic opportunity that can go from one generation to another. And that is why it is so clear that business should do what it does well, which is create jobs. And that if we do that and everyone felt they could do better, we would make a sustaining impact on that, and meaning change it. And that's what 110 was trying to do and is trying to do is say, what are the barriers we can remove and systemic issues we can address? So Ken said they'd be changed for everyone, but that they would also be changed permanently for the future. And so by doing and going after what we said were family sustaining jobs, those are depending on the country, or excuse me, the part of our country, it's anywhere between 50 and $70,000 a year for a beginning job, that is family sustaining. And then that, the second part of this and what one thing will help do to break that is that we're saying these are not dead end jobs. We also made sure the jobs we're putting people in are jobs that have upward mobility because this is these are careers we're trying to offer, not just a job. And I think that's a really important point. There are other issues in the economy for other low income jobs. We are really targeting to say, can we pull a group of people that have never been in this segment 
into it and then provide them with upward mobility from that point on. And that would change the numbers that you cited there over the long run and permanently. Mm -hmm. Can you know the the founding companies that are part of this initiative? Uh, it's like a who's who, from Accenture to General Motors to Medtronic to Walmart, uh, just to name a few. How did you all go about recruiting these companies, and are you expecting to announce any additional partners in the near future? Well, let me start by saying that those are companies that are led by CEOs who see that this is a moment in our country where we can actually do more to build middle skills and create opportunities for people who are disadvantaged. So we really didn't recruit, we didn't call people. People answered the call. Uh, because I think all of us in business know that we have a, a real responsibility. What makes our country different from other countries that have similar problems around the world is our stated creeds, but also the role of the private sector that has the talent, the resources, and the infrastructure to help reinvent the company. So coming out of this pandemic, we're going to have to reinvent our, our economy. And I think there are a lot of CEOs who want their companies to be a part of that. And so they raised their hands and they said, we want to be a part of that. And by the way, it's not just about hiring people who are of disadvantage. We're also putting together what we call a community of practice, where these employers are going to actually help each other figure out how we can provide a more inclusive workplace ourselves and create longer term retention and advancement of the black employees in our companies right now. Because as you know, there's often a glass ceiling for black employees in, this com in these companies. They don't stay long. And so in addition to hiring people, we want to make sure that our companies are exemplars of inclusive workplaces. Jenny, anything to add to that? No, I, I would just say that um, it's very inspirational to see that all of our colleagues know that this is a long-term effort. They've dedicated themselves to it for the long term. As you know, Ken and I are co-chairs, but uh, this formation was, there was Ken Chenault, Charles Phillips, Kevin Shearer, others who've dedicated a lot of time as kind of a core group. And then as the group expanded here to all of the CEOs you listed, they are going to stay at it. And this community of practice is CEO led. We all know that it isn't just about changing a job requisition. You really are changing the talent system in your company, every piece of it to bring in this new cohort of colleagues. And so that isn't a short term job. And you're fixing something systemic and they will and they have all personally committed to stay on the community of practice and this is a ceo driven initiative which when you drive a new paradigm and you do something for the long term it's the only way it will sustain itself in that vein jenny how do we hold these corporations accountable uh, will there be tracking of hiring will you release uh, this information either on a quarterly or annually uh, annual basis Yes, this is a very good point. And, you know, it's, as, as Ken said, our colleagues are so committed. Actually, the biggest discussion with every one of them was a real vetting if they felt they could honor those hiring commitments. So they didn't want to sign up if they didn't know they could do it. So they've all been through this process. And so we've had non-disclosures so that people will share the data, not just to report on it. It's also to improve, right? And as Ken said, part of what we want to do is be sure we keep all the people in the system and promote them. So we have an intake and then an advancement set of metrics. So the short answer to that is we will have those metrics and we will publish something in group that is going to hold ourselves accountable to meet these numbers because none of us want to do this without producing the outcome, right? So as a member of 110, we should be able to create better outcomes for both representation and mobility upward than we could have by not being a member of 110. So, so yes, we will have our own targets and there will be some numbers that we will publish as well. Um, I also we have want just, to say that, oh, yes. just to be clear, we're not fooling ourselves. Make no mistake, this work will be hard. Trying to cultivate, develop a comprehensive system that brings together leading companies, suppliers, others, in partnership with leading nonprofits and skill credentialing organizations to create the kind of pipeline that we need is a non-trivial exercise. But we're going to stick it with it, and I think it's important what Jenny said. These people are making a 10-year commitment. We won't do this overnight. We can't start from a standing start and get to where we want to get. But I think we all believe that with our collective efforts and the efforts of others, we can create greater equity and inclusion. 
Um, any other thoughts before we close? Jimmy? I would only echo what Ken said earlier, anyone watching, right? We uh, we had 500 other companies reach out to us after the announcement. Everyone is welcome. And even if you can't contribute on supply, please, if you can hire, right? That is the most important thing and will help do the vetting. So I'd only close by saying, we hope this being the largest private sector initiative in this area, we all hope that we are really able to make a substantive difference in this country for so many people. And I'll say, we're doing this not just to make our companies better, but to make our country better. 